welcome. This is Dr. Paul Guy. Welcome to Two Bridges Live, another show here, the Bridges Live podcast. I'd like to thank all my um, sponsors and all my listeners and all the people that can download. Remember, you can always catch me and ask me questions on drpaulholisticscience.com or just drpauldwdyer at gmail.com if that's a little easier for you. Of course, I'd like to have all my people and like to thank all my previous guests and my future guests that I'd love to have on to Bridges Live because Bridges is about getting you from here to there. We know that. That's why we take the bridge. That's why we go over them. That's why we, we, we swim under them. We've done all these things and metaphorically about Bridges, but it's about information, understanding, and action. And I have on the line here a person that's running for Baltimore Mayor. Baltimore Mayor. Mayor in Baltimore. How do you want to say that? And it's going to be a very volatile, I think, race. And Sean, introduce yourself, and then we'll get right into why you're running and and, and all the things, I think, why it's going to be such a hostile race. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Sean. Well, uh, uh, a couple things. Uh, Number one, uh, I am a father of three children and the grandfather of seven, and this is probably one of the most important uh, things that have happened to me in life, is to have these wonderful children and grandchildren. Uh, Secondly, I've had a lot of experience over the years. I'm 78, so I'm not what you call a spring chicken who's running (laughs) from there. (laughs) No spring chicken, John. No spring chicken. No, but I probably have more energy than Bernie Sanders, but that's another story. (laughs) But So I have a lot of experience. I've been in Baltimore. I I moved here. uh, I moved down to this area in 1960, right outside of uh, Baltimore, and I was was a monk. I was in a Catholic religious order called the Christian Brothers, and they teach in different places around the world. And I was in that order for about 12 years. And I moved back to, to the Philadelphia area, and then I started teaching in Jersey City. And when I was getting my doctorate at Columbia University and also in religion at Union Theological, uh, uh, I did my dissertation. I worked at Newsweek magazine as a reporter. I worked on a couple of books by a very famous writer named Gary Sheehy. Yes. And so then I, yeah, so I, then I taught at a, I taught at a couple colleges, including an historically black college, Allen University. In, uh, in South Carolina, and then I came up back up north. But to make a long story short, I left the teaching field for 25 years as a speechwriter at Honeywell and then a Digital Equipment Corporation, and then at uh, uh, at IBM for 12 years. And my boss w- was uh, reported to to, to uh, a person who became the CEO of IBM. But he he and then later his successor, they were in charge of the uh, of the public sector. So I've had a lot of experience, and uh, I've been involved. When I lived up in the Boston area, I I was elected twice to be a school committee member uh, in in a small uh, school district, Ipswich, Massachusetts. And so I had the opportunity to really get involved in the community and so forth. So I moved down here to Baltimore, and and, uh, I'll try to be, I'm talking too long, I think, about this, but I moved down into Baltimore, and I, I... uh, for, uh, several years ago, and I, my daughter lives. I bought a house here, reti- retired here, and uh, had a two-family house. And my youngest daughter had just had her first child, and uh, and so I came down to to help out a little bit. And so then I got very immersed in, in uh, trying to understand what the situation here is in Baltimore, and I was very concerned. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful city. But it's got very, very serious problems. And I really believe that it's two cities. It's one that's the beautiful inner, inner city, down to, uh, inner harbor, it's called. Right. Downtown, very progressive area, beautiful area, great people here, great neighborhoods surrounding this area. But then there is what I refer to as Baltimore's forgotten majority. Yep. These are the 150,000 or more people who live at or below the poverty level, and they're not served well, and they're forgotten. Well, to be well, very honest with you. Well, Sean, before you get into the forgotten community, and 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 I, I'm going to touch on that, and I want to go back, and I think. 
I think even people who don't live in Baltimore, who listen to this podcast, who don't understand what Baltimore is, or even what it looks like in the glooming cloud that hangs over, you know, inner city Baltimore. We know Baltimore was burning at one time, and we know Baltimore in the in the 80s was burning again, and we know of all the different types of explosions that happens for a lot of different reasons because Baltimore and its civic leadership did not get along with the people. But what is the history of Baltimore? How did it become what Baltimore is today? We know it's a harbor community. We know it's a port city. But where did its where did its influx in people come from? Do you know that part? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, I've been reading uh, extensively about the history of Baltimore, and put it succinctly, it's uh, the one book that tells the best story about Baltimore is called Not in My Neighborhood. Okay. And it talks about the history of segregation. It talks about the history of segregation over the last 150 years or so or more. And uh, and uh, it, it's a very grim picture of how the city was systematically uh, organized, redlined, if you will, in the mm-hmm. redlined district. So to be honest with you, it's a city, it's a beautiful city, great people, but to be honest with you, that the sections of the city, particularly the most troubled sections, I would just consider it almost apartheid. Yeah. And nobody, nobody wants to say that. Nobody wants to talk about this, but that's what it is. And, and, and it's, uh, and, and the, the irony, and the crazy thing is that the people who have been neglected, their, their families, their ancestors are the people who built a quite a beautiful city. And so uh, that, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's the long and short of it. No. And by the way, in, in the real estate, let me just ask something about the real estate. Uh, the hostility toward not just uh, 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 people of color, but Jews, for example, and, and uh, uh, there's a lot of prejudice over the years uh, with regard to housing, with regard to anybody who is Jewish. And then, of course, there was prejudice against a lot of other immigrant groups. So it's got that history. But right now, it's got the potential to actually break, to move forward. And and, and if, if we can start paying more attention to that other side of the city, I think we can overcome many, many serious issues. Now, to let people know, thank everyone for listening to Bridges Live, and I'm talking to uh, Sean Gresh. I did pronounce your last name correctly, right, Gresh? Oh, yes, you did, yes. Excellent. So I'm talking to Sean Gresh. He's running for the mayor of uh, the city of Baltimore. And Baltimore has a long history. I mean, all cities have a very long history. But this was probably the first major city that started out as a segregated city and redlining and systematically putting people on one side or the other, where the others were kind of like being a New Yorker. Things were set up differently um, because of the influx in the ghettos and, and the people staying around each other. Baltimore was literally set up to divide. And it still has that sense of division in it, like you said, Sean. And here's the question. Most people don't know. If you're listening to the podcast, they'll read your bio. They'll see the links. But you're a white male trying to fix a damaged black city that has a lot of black problems. How is that going to be tough for you? Well, uh, all that I can tell you is that uh, I've been received extremely well, but I, I have been spending a lot of time visiting people in those areas, mm-hmm. the tough areas. And here, here's the response I get. First of all, I've been going to the first, the toughest areas, two areas where there have been so many murders. Last year we broke all records by, yep. for the number of murders. Uh, but but uh, people are saying to myself, oh, this is fantastic. Somebody is paying attention to us, to the other side of Baltimore. So that's the response uh, I get. Now, I realize that I, 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 I probably am the only white um, person running in this race. I think you are. Knowledge. I think you are. Yeah, I think I am, yes. So, but I, I come from the background. I spent all these years in the Christian Brothers. Right. And I taught my children, so I come from a background where, you know, I, I don't even 
I mean, I do think about that. But by the way, I should say to you, this is important. I have some skin in the game insofar as my daughter married a, a South African, a black South African, mm -hmm. and, and my sixth grandchild of the seven, he's a year and a half, and, and he's growing up, he's going to grow up here, right. or wherever he grows up. But anyway, so I thought, and I'm, I'm real concerned, and also, too, I, I had the experience of a lifetime when I taught at a black college in South Carolina, right. where I heard stories about, you know, and so forth. And so I'm real sensitive, and also, too, uh, I, I am very comfortable, and I think it's important for us to talk about about race when it's, uh, when it's, when it's, when it's appropriate. But, uh, but anyway, so, but you know, yeah, you're it, right. I'm, I'm a, you, 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 we, we were talking before we got on air. Um, there has been some corruption in Baltimore. Now, we know there's corruption all through politics, from the top to the bottom to the left to the right, all through it, right? So there has been some bad corruption in Baltimore. And do you find that the corruption that is still so heavily, top heavily, in Baltimore is what's crushing Baltimore? Well, uh, I, I don't think that's, that's the only problem. Okay. And, and I, I, I think what's sad is that uh, Baltimore gets a black eye yeah. for, for, for the two mayors that, that got in trouble and so forth. And then there have been a number of other politicians uh, that have gotten in trouble. But by and large, I, I don't think that uh, – I, 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 I think people gloss over – that they say – the Baltimore is totally corrupt, blah, 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 blah. But I don't think that's the case. Mm. I, I think there are a number of people who are corrupt, and there's, there's, there's probably more corruption in the police department than we see. Yeah, they, they just arrested eight guys last year and sent them to jail. But, but the point is that um, uh, I think that there's, the majority of people in Baltimore are the salt of the East. So the diverse people, and I know we have problems of corruption and so forth, but the focus, the media likes to play that up all the time. And even in this race, by the way, for mayor, uh, what's going, what's happening, and, and it happens to other places around the country, is that the media takes, they look at it as a race as opposed to looking at the conditions of the of the issues. Wow, you're right. So I don't know if that answers, answers your question. It, it does, but. it does. And, and I wish we were able to because, you know, when I do my podcast, I like to look at the light of people and the positive of people and the positive of change and the positive of what we can move forward. You know, I teach a lot of emotional education, emotional intelligence, and, and to how to heal your trauma. And we can heal our trauma. We just, like you said, we have to talk about it and stop turning a blind eye. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and that, but what I find is there's, uh, can I just comment? I've been going to a lot of churches, uh, and it's renewed my whole spiritual side of me. Because I spent in this Catholic religious order, it, it, we were teaching, we were laymen, we were not priests. But we taught at different schools like LaSalle University and St. Mary's in College and a lot of high schools. But here's what I'm finding. I've gone to Catholic churches. I've gone to Protestant churches. I've gone to Baptist churches, AME churches. I don't I go in and, and I don't say to anybody that I, I, I'll officially announce my, my uh, candidacy in, in two weeks. But, and I have a website up and all that. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that I go into these churches, particularly the Baptist churches, the AMA churches, and I just find them spiritually uplifting. And I find they're doing, every one of those churches, they're doing stuff in the community. Right. Uh, and I, I, I find that the churches are probably the untapped resource for transformation of the city. I agree. And, uh, and, and I don't think people understand that. And, and, and also, too, by the way, when the riots occurred five years ago, when Freddie Gray was sadly, tragically killed, murdered, if you will, but killed, uh, that, that people came together, and, and a lot of great things happened. But the problem is, we've got like 600, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteer groups. People are doing things left, right, and center all over the city. 
people are going out of the way to help others. And the problem is we got to get it better coordinated, and we probably have to add another tens of tens of thousands of people in that. But we've got a chance to really pull pull up, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps because there's a lot of goodness. There's a lot of uh, deeply religious people who are uh, uh, who are out there. And by the way, one of the things that I found out because I, most of the churches I go to are, 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 are people of color is that. The, the sense of forgiveness that you see, particularly people who are the evangelical churches and so forth, the sense of, of forgiveness they have for people who have made mistakes, et cetera, is, is, is amazing. Because you don't, you don't hear about these things in some of the other churches that I go to. But anyway, I'm going on. I'm sorry, sorry if I'm going too fast. No, 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 not at all. Because I, I hear the excitement, you know, and I can feel the passion that you have, and I and I understand it because that's why we do. That's why good people do great things, and is when people stand to the sidelines and allow things to continue to happen that's when disaster happens and i just don't understand how people can stand by and allow good people to suffer and people all people we are all people of god's children and we are suffering and we are saddened and we are traumatically traumatized by the neighborhoods we live in and like i do some work down i'm on the board of a a um homeless shelter that's down on fremont avenue and when i go down there for different meetings or and i give classes down there out in front on Pennsylvania Avenue, there's nothing but block. There's like five, six blocks in any direction of vacant homes, vacant buildings that seems like is. And we have all this homeless problem. What is some of those things can we fix? Oh, first of all, that's a big one. Now, let me explain to you. I I, uh, uh, I, uh, I met a few days ago. Uh, I met a woman and her husband, and they're homeless. They, they, they've been living in a home that doesn't have heat, doesn't have water, doesn't have electricity. And I interviewed them, and I, I think, I don't know on my website if we have a little clip of that interview, but I was quite moved by that. I talked to them about their, their children and so forth. And then uh, uh, I talked, to, there was a march to, to raise money for Earl's Place, which is a uh, a place here for uh, the homeless, and I asked the woman who is a volunteer for that group, I said, what do you think, can the city do more to help the homeless? And she said, sure, they can do a lot more. So uh, so I'm, I'm trying to explore that meeting people and so forth, and, and it's, it's like, it's like we, we don't want to hear about that. I got criticized by somebody on my website, uh, to, to uh, a gentleman there, who said, well, you showed a picture of a, of a homeless person who's living, he was on the street two blocks from the city. And all that I said is that a mayor, if somebody's going to be a leader, should be able to say, look, this, this should not happen to, to kind of get people to be aware. But people aren't even aware of that. Now, I have to say this. Yesterday, uh, one of the, my volunteers, a w- wonderful young man who's, who's you know, strong, he's got a, a, couple, uh, he's got a, a child with his wife, and, and uh, so he's helping me. And so we went out, and we went to West Baltimore, and he said, well, why don't, why don't we see if we can talk to my friend? So we said, okay. And we, we went to his friend's house, and his friend is the father of a, of a young woman, 21 years old, who was murdered uh, two weeks ago, a couple of days before Christmas. And I interviewed him, and it was a, a wonderful interview, but so moving and touching. And here's a guy who, who he said, I'm angry. I have a hard time expressing my anger. But he says he was a kind guy. He didn't go on railing about this and that. And he's trying to deal with it, uh, you know, privately. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is that we've had so many people murdered, and it's almost like if they're murdered in neighborhoods that are tough, yeah. that's okay. It's not okay, but well, we don't we don't want to hear about that. Uh, because that's over there, and I think that's the attitude. Because you don't, you hear about murders and so forth, you don't get any sense of who these human beings are. Right, right. Uh, now, by the way, there are people who are doing, who are trying to to pay attention to them, and there are people in those neighborhoods. But the point is that this man lost his daughter. She had a, a, a beauty salon, 
uh, very close to where I live. I live uh, uh, right near Patterson Park. And and the point is, when we lose somebody like that, we all lose, yeah. whether you're black, white, purple, or green. I mean, but but that's that's the kind of sense that I take from from these deaths that, that are occurring and so forth. But you know, you know, Sean, and again, I'd like to thank all my listeners for listening to Bridges Live. I, I was when I was out there, so I walked the streets and I talked and. Here's the. I wanted to take a picture, but I was just. I was literally crying too much for me to take this picture. Outside of on Pennsylvania, that area over there by Fremont, there's this empty vacant lot. It, I, there has to be about thirty people out there selling drugs, screaming, holding it out as cars go by slowly. On the other side of the street, there are two police officers sitting in their cop car allowing this to happen so it seems like it's okay if they sell drugs there but don't move from this spot and and i was so blown away by this apathy or maybe like there's nothing like the police officers are maybe saying there's nothing to, and i wanted to go up to the police officers and go like why is this okay and he'd be like oh you must not live i'm sure he probably gave me some smart who knows but i just couldn't do it so what you, and you see that a lot going on in Baltimore, don't you? Yes, but here, here's the story that I've heard from a couple people, is that right now what's happened is because of the corruption in the police department and yeah. the eight, particularly eight uh, men who were sent away to jail, uh, and they should be sent away to jail, but uh, what people say is that there's a, a consent decree, that is the federal government came in, pretty much took over the, the department, the police department. It's actually under the agency. It's an agency of the state now. Okay. And, in fact, the mayor can only hire or fire the police commissioner, so the mayor's hands are kind of tied. But, anyway, with this police consent, uh, a consent decree, the policemen have to abide by, uh, 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 by being sensitive to people's civil rights. And so, therefore, they can't go beat up kids anymore, beat up, beat them up, as, as many of them did, by the way. And so, therefore, many of the police, the fraternal order of police, are very upset about this decree, uh, this uh, consent decree, because they feel their hands are tied. And so, the story in the street that I've heard from a couple people, but well, one policeman reportedly said to the person who is my source, said that if somebody was mugged and threw me over there and ran away, I would not run after him because they're worried about being uh, caught on tape doing something they shouldn't be doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, there is some detention, and I think that's one of the problems. But I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, as long as you do it in my neighborhood or in some other neighborhood, it's okay. But, but, but that you have to deal with. Now, the problem is, is that the, the, the people, this is a, uh, I'm working now on this whole plan to look at and how you deal with crime and, and murder and so forth. But, but the people closest to the, the, the people in the neighborhoods are the police. So you've got to work with the police. In fact, most of them are honest. Yeah. They've got families, et cetera. Yeah. So the point is that, in fact, even the man that I interviewed yesterday in his home, um, he had a boy in house. He was he's the man whose his daughter died. He said, all the police that I know, he said, they're, they're good. They're good people. He said, I haven't had any problem with the police. Now, you hear that in different stories from others. But the point is, you've got to work with the police. You know what's happening now, right now in the city? You've got the police commissioner who's helped very much. He, he has a very good track record. He's in charge of put of uh, rooting out corruption, changing the attitude, et cetera. And he's criticized by a lot of police leaders, and he's criticized sometimes by some of the candidates. But the point is that there's lots of fighting going on between these different groups. And I think, and my point is, criminals are not stupid. No. They're not dumb. They see that there's conflict, and so they're taking advantage of it. And they're getting away with murder. Because... We, we have three or four hundred policemen that we need, we don't have, and they've only, they've only tracked down, I think, uh, three out of every ten murders do they have a lead on. Uh, so people are getting away with murder, and with all this infighting going on, 
uh, it's not very helpful. So I, I think I'm pardon me if I'm going off in too many different directions. No, 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 no. You know, it, it, here's the thing that we're going to do continuously. We're going to continue to do this for the election and let people know what they need to do to get a hold of you so they can help you out, support you, and and go from there. Oh, that would be, that'd be wonderful because that would really be wonderful. Well, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be, uh, in fact, I'm going to be staying. I'm, I'm, right now I'm arranging to spend three or four days in a couple of the roughest neighborhoods so I can be in the neighborhoods and and get around and talk to people and said i'm for real i'm I'm not somebody who's just going to make promises and then forget about you so uh, what's what's the what's the what's the website they can get a hold of and what's the phone number they can call okay the website is called one baltimore mayor.com that's all spelled out o n e you know baltimore mayor all one word dot com Okay, and, and the phone the phone number is four four three two one four eight one eight zero. All right, Sean. Thank you. That now, is, can, can I can I add one thing? Let me give you my my own private number because. Anybody, people listening to your office, here's a number. That number, by the way, is the phone that I have. But I also have another private number, and, and I, 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 I don't mind sharing it. It's 617-513-2242. Yeah. You're right. Sean, I know that we're, you know. So here's the other question. You don't win. This doesn't go where you would like to. What's next, and do you stay helping Baltimore be better Baltimore? I want to start a group called Baltimore's Gray Panthers. Now, back in late 60s, 70s, there was a woman named uh, Molly, you know, uh, I think it was Molly Kuhn. Uh, I can't think of her first. I think it's, uh, anyway. Uh, she founded a group called the Great Panthers, which is a group of about 35,000 people. And what they did is they were elderly, and they would go into their respective neighborhoods, and they would go into the courts. They would go into they they were like uh, uh, an outside looking in at what was happening in government. And uh, I think that. A group like that would be very important. They go to the courts, they go to the criminal courts, they go to the juvenile courts and so forth, they go to council meetings, etc. They report back to a website as what's happening. But they don't report about all negative stuff. They report about positive right, stuff. Right, right. So let people know what's happening in the community. And as a force, I think that uh, people my age, I'm 78, but people who are older, retired, I think they're a resource that... Uh, almost wasted right now because a lot of people, they don't know what they can do. But that group of people, uh, that us I'm talking about, we can offer so much more to society and we can help out in ways. We don't have to risk our lives going into stuff. But there's so many different ways that we can help. And the idea, my idea is to pull together the two Baltimore to be one. But but this group, this great Panther, this Baltimore Baltimore's uh, uh, great great Panthers, um, I, I think, it would be a very important uh, group, and it would keep an eyes and ears out for what's happening in the city because there's so much happening that people don't know about, and and the public should know about. It. And the newspapers nowadays, we don't have, they don't have the resources that they had before because they keep us honest. They do uh, in the media, but anyway, but a group like that it would be a very important group. Uh, to follow. And also, too, I probably will go back to, I've written a couple books years and years ago, one's called Becoming a Father, um, and uh, so I'll go back to, to writing. But, but right now, I'm, I'm uh, dedicating every ounce of my energy and every, uh, <laughs> the whole waking day to getting out there and meeting people and so forth. And, I, uh, and it, anyway, I'm hoping they continue uh, uh, to continue the fight. 
And by the way, I'm doing it for very little money. I, I need money you know, for the campaign, but the, my competitors, some of them will be spending millions of dollars. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm going to just a tiny little bit of that I'm going to. I mean, I'm using my imagination, and I've got a great uh, person who's behind me who has a media background, so, so that's where I'm coming from. Well, thank you, Sean, and thank you again for coming on Bridges Live with me, and I look forward to working together, really. So thank you, all my listeners, and remember, please contact Sean, follow the race if you're in Baltimore, if you're outside of Baltimore. If you're just not, if you're just in your own personal city, do something. Please be informed, understand what's going on, and take action and take back your city before it falls away, falls down, and crumbles, because we have many cities many global countries that are falling apart for a lot of hostility and hate. We need to clear that up. Thank you so much for listening to Bridges Live with Dr. Paul.